Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Westboro. Um, these people were just laughing at me a moment ago because I, I pointed out to them that an hour and a half ago, I blithely went into my dentist's office and was sitting in the chair, and then all of a sudden he injected me with Novocaine. And I said, but I have a TV show to go to. So I'm talking a little bit like this today, so these things will think this is very funny. So anyway, with me here, my friend Shelby Marshall. Hi, folks. Uh, and, and as you know, our, the point of this show uh, is to be talking about my friends Frank and Mary, the example couple that I always use when I'm doing senior presentations. And, they, and their goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And really, they want to live in their house and they want to live in their community. Right. right? So the goal of this show is, if you're Frank and Mary and you're living in Westboro, what are the people you need to know? What are the programs that are in place or that should be in place? so that you can live in your house until you die. Absolutely. Right? And, so, and where is Westboro going to sort of get there? Because we're not there yet, right? Right. So it's sort of right. in, in, as we're all learning in sort of a bit of an evolution. And today we have an awesome guest with us. A wicked awesome A wicked, <laughs> wicked, a wicked awesome. awesome. <laughs> right. Not quite as awesome as the socks. That, that's right. I mean, we got to put right. it in context. That's right. right. That's right. I don't even come that's close. Right. Right. We had right. to pull her away from going to the parade just so that she <laughs> at this show. This is like, this right. is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, so Tammy Pozeriki, um, welcome. I believe you've been on the show, uh, one of Arthur's shows before here in Westboro, yep. so you may be a familiar face to those uh, tuning in today. So yes. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And so um, kind of as we do, we want to learn about our guests, we want our audience to learn about our guests, kind of who are you, why are you here today, and um, what's your connection to dementia and Alzheimer's? Yeah. So I have been in the field for about 23 years um, as a social worker, working with families and uh, people living with dementia. And along came my grandmother, who also lived with dementia. So I've had the opportunity of having both a personal experience and a professional mm -hmm. experience. And along my journey, I sort of found this gap. And the gap was, what are the folks at home doing who can no longer navigate and attend the senior center, mm -hmm. who are not ready for any type of memory care facility? Mm -hmm. What do they do all day? Because socialization is actually the number one treatment for, for mm -hmm. someone living with dementia. Um, so I bought a home, a single family home, converted it into an adult day program that specialized in Alzheimer's and dementia earlier onset. Um, Which is how I met Tay. Right? Yeah. We oh, that's to, right. Because we were trying to get the permits to do this because the zoning officials were like, you're going to do a what? You know, where, where was this in the car? And you want to talk so, about a, an interesting connection between yeah, all of us yeah. is that the house she bought is my wife's, was my wife's brother's home. Oh. Is that crazy? Is that crazy? This is it. This is. This is so like I had a connection with Gail before I knew Gail and Shelby. That's right. It's just, this, this is great. Small, yeah, this is great. Small world. Yeah. Small world. Yeah. So I named. So you started this great program. Yeah. Yep. That was 10 yeah. years ago and I named it Pleasant Trees, which I just like that name. I don't even know where I got it. Um, so I have recently sold Pleasant Trees um, to a gentleman who um, is has as much passion, if not more, than I do. And he is going to continue the services and mission, so I'm very happy about that. Um, and now I am doing specialized dementia training and consulting. So let, let me bring you back in the time machine just for a moment. For our audience who may not be familiar with what Pleasant Trees, and they're trying to Google it right now, <laughs> That's Tell us about what, what is pleasantries. So there's two models of adult day care program, however you want to call it. One is a medical model, one is a social model. Okay. And the medical model is regulated, licensed, um, usually a very large census, mm -hmm. um, taking in all walks of life and all challenges that people mm -hmm. have where and many people with really serious challenges oh yeah both, both physical and cognitive mm -hmm. right? absolutely right. and all ages right. too um where a, a and typically with a nurse on staff and a whole bunch of there's a, a regulatory of stuff. Yeah. uh staffing yeah. Yeah, yeah. ratio and all yeah. that that's the medical um, model. Yeah. so the social model is really something that's not seen there's mm -hmm. only three of the home-based social models in Massachusetts. Okay. And I thought 10 years ago that these, this was gonna boom, yep. that every right. town was gonna have a pleasantries. Um, but being in a home environment and only accepting up to 14 guests and having three staff and engaging them in what we call work-related activity, household activity, 
these are things that they've lost in their lives to create a purpose. Mm. And although we can all say bingo will never die, <laughs> um, that's a fun activity. And we need those two, um, but we need them successful mm -hmm. and failure free. Mm -hmm. And it slows the progression. So, so who was, who was, who, I mean, I, I know from my own personal experience, my brother-in-law was at Pleasantries for a while, one of my brothers-in-law, several of my clients have been at Pleasantries, but can you just talk about who is the person who would usually be at Pleasantries and who would, and would have taken advantage of Pleasantries? And you can talk as a non, in a non-conflict situation now because you just sold Pleasantries, right? Yeah, so right. it's, right. But just kind of talk about that, so who, who would be appropriate? I, I'm gonna tell you a quick story about my greatest reward in my career. And that was a woman who was born in Hungary, who was working at a nursing home as a housekeeper for 36 years. Mm. And they had to let her go mm. because of her disease. She was walking off the job. <laughs> and although, she, she I'm had, done. <laughs> she had a dementia problem. But right. the problem was that she had established, that was her second family. Right. And now all of a sudden, she has nothing. So her son called. And um, he said, she is so clinically depressed. I can't get her out of the house. She won't go anywhere. So I crafted an idea, a fiblet, as you will, um, which was that I went to her house and yes. I interviewed her for a job. Fantastic. I needed a housekeeper and I heard you were available. And awesome. so we actually negotiated a rate. Um, son would bring her in the morning, give me a little cash. At the end of the day, I'd give him cash. She came in her scrubs. And oh, I it, love it. And, and certainly we gave her household activities to help us with, but right. she was engaged. That was the point. She made connections again. She was no longer depressed anymore. Wow. So that's, that was an extreme, uh, experience but, not, but but almost not really i mean extreme in you know it's sort of yours but but we find certainly you know kind of as we care for folks in the home care in in home care one-to-one -one, it's that same thing it's that purpose it's that making that connection with the individual for what was important to them what was relevant to them and then um you know maybe simplifying or modifying the the task or the activity so that they do feel that purpose, absolutely right? Right? absolutely so, wow. it's just so important and you know, what happens with folks in the earlier stages that aren't engaged like that, um, they will feel the symptoms of depression, they will isolate, they will withdraw, right. and the disease will progress quicker. Mm. And so the goal, in, very, in, in many cases, just to get folks out, and to, but to get them not out just doing nothing, but be feeling like they're really doing something. Right. Now, did you find that, that that view of what you were going to do at Pleasantries changed over time? Because you were there for like 10 years. So, because now you're really, because of that experience, that, that notion of really of having people really feel engaged in what they were doing. It's, it's, that's a really interesting notion. I, I, I'm, you know, within a certain radius, I'm right. not no longer able to right. consult to build these, but right. as long as it's outside that radius, I yeah. want to see these grow and I can help people establish them. Yeah. You know? And as far as what people were doing there, what, you know, what individuals were doing, mm -hmm. did you find that what they were doing was like you changed it over time? Um, well, you adapt yeah. based on their ability and what's successful. So, so highly customized for each individual. Very. Right? They call it yeah. person-centered. Right. You right. know, where you're creating the activities around who's there, right. Right. what right. are their interests, and, and you just, as things start to get maybe frustrating, mm -hmm. that's yeah. when you start to change yeah. things. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Right. And that could be d disease progression. It could just be a bad day, right? Absolutely. Right? So, right, the activity that you've planned, and so... This is sort of this is something we were talking about a little bit before we rolled the tape, um, um, but I think that sometimes as the individual, the caregiver potentially, who sort of has a plan, right? Okay, today is Tuesday, and Dad's going to get a shower, and right. then we're going to go grocery shopping, and then we're going to get his haircut. That's the plan. I've already mapped it out, and we're going to do it in so much time because today is my day with Dad, and that's a great plan, right, Tammy? That always works, right? Right? The plan looks beauteous right? until you really try to execute right. that right. plan. Right, right, right. And so that's really hard for the for the caregiver, you know, wife's, um, um, you know, daughter, son, doesn't matter, right? But the, the reality of someone with dementia is not my reality. So talk a little bit about kind of 
going to where that person is and the importance of that, if you that, We call it reality orientation because people, we live in our reality. We mm-hmm. live in the current moment. It's Halloween Sometimes we day. Don't want to. It's, exactly. <laughs> right. Sometimes I want to be in the reality. <laughs> right. um, but, it, you know, it's, it's where we are and where they are. And we can smooth the communications. We can smooth and, and really reduce burnout. Well, because that's one of the biggest challenges, right? It's not that folks don't want to care for their loved one. It's that they just might not have the the, the tools, not the skills, the toolbox, right? Right. The toolbox. And they're exhausted because it's constant. And so give us, an, the, let's talk about kind of those examples of the, the, the constant of the individual who says, you know, keeps talking about mom who died. Right. So right. that happens all the time. Right. Right. Um, and I think our first reaction is, why are they talking about their mother? They died 30 years. And don't they know that? Well, right. Why right. wouldn't they know yeah. that? Right. So what I've experienced is at the end of the day, um, Terry's calling out for her father and wanting to go home. And, of course, we validate the feelings. We empathize the feelings. We fiblet. Fiblet is not a lie. It's not a white lie. It is a therapeutic non-truth. That's what we call it. It's easier for I families to accept. I haven't verified this with a priest. <laughs> <laughs> As to whether it is a sin. Maybe it's not a lie. Is this a sin? Right. No, sorry. So, um, but back in the day, they used to teach people to correct, right. to tell them, no, you're wrong, um, to really try to brainwash them into thinking you're reality. And right. all that does is create negative feelings. Sure. So we'd get Terry at a good place. She'd go home, and she'd start all over again. Where's my father? I want to go home. And her husband, your father died 30 years ago. You are home. Right. This, this is, is where right. you've been. We've raised our kids together. Right. She doesn't remember any of that. And in the right. moment... What she is looking for is just yeah, some, what is she looking for? She's looking for safety and security and comfort. That's what's missing. So she's scared. Mm-hmm. It's later in the day. She's she's moving into the sundowning mm-hmm. hours, we right. call it. Um, but just to do that little bit of fiblet and reassurance, it goes a long way. So in not knowing Terry's situation, would a good good a, a good example of a fiblet say, um, your dad actually called, and he's going to be late because he has to work a little longer. Absolutely, he you and the key is or, to know the history, right? right? To know right. the past, to know right. the history. so that they don't call you out. Right. They're not. Right. It doesn't make you he dumb. He doesn't work at night. He works. That's right. Right. right, right. Like, so, oh, that's so, so like, a terrible film. <laughs> so like <laughs> Arthur, who was asking for his mother, I would say your mother's at the beauty parlor. Yep. She never worked a day outside the house. So if I had said to him. Right. She's at work. She'll be by. He would have called me out on my BS, That's and then right. he would have been still distraught. Right. And now so, maybe there's an element, even though the person has some diminished capacity, now I'm not trusting you, right? Yeah. Right. right? That destroys the trust. Right. Right. Absolutely. But in all it, fairness to the families, yeah. most families, caregivers, they don't know that. Right. Mm-hmm. So so much of it, as, you, as you're describing it, is... You're not going. You're not going to ha- cause a person with the disease to not have the disease. You're not going to cause somebody with cancer to not have cancer. Well, m- you know, maybe, but someday. certainly not. Maybe right. someday, you know. But so the real question is, how do you adapt? And therefore, the key is really the understand having more understanding from the adapters and being able mm-hmm. to really train them and have them talking. Yeah. Right? And and have the caregivers. And I think that's the whole point mm-hmm. of what we call dementia friendly community. Right. It's those people in the community that just don't understand the disease. And how how can we create a community that's accepting, mm-hmm. that they want to go and engage in mm-hmm. and not yeah. hide in their house? I think um, as Shelby and I were talking um, in our meeting, we were talking about how they've adapted and almost required every a public access building to accommodate for the differently abled, mm-hmm. you know, with wheelchairs and grab bars and this and that. But we've not made changes for folks living with dementia. With dementia. Right. We, we, right. We're getting there. Yeah. We right. certainly are getting there, but it's a lot of people who need to come together like a village mm-hmm. and make it happen. Yeah, I remember so, reading about, uh, oh, no, there was, a, there was a, a, a store owner in uh, England with, it was, had, had done all this, these things to help, had trained folks to help folks who were there with dementia and stuff. And, and uh, somebody asked him to describe it. He said, well, I'm simply creating mental ramps, you know? Remember mm-hmm. in the old days there were no ramps? Oh, that's great. And it was always a hassle to get in. And now there are every, ramps, that you just assume it, there's a ramp. 
Well, these are just mental ramps. That's you know, great. It's just a wonderful. Wow. Wonderful and those emotion. ramps are yeah. are just knowledge. They're maybe maybe making the environment a little easier <coughs> for that person, mm -hmm. knowing how to approach and communicate. Right. I mean, that's basic. You know. So, what, yeah. give us an example of approaching someone who, you know, clearly, you know, and maybe even in a stranger kind of situation, right? So, I don't know. So, you're approaching me. You see that maybe I'm kind of a little bit of an altered state, and you know, and I'm in my 80s and just right. So, what what is that approach to someone? And, and you're at the senior center, let's say. And we say, were you going to say something? No, no, okay, no. well, we say that it's first of all always important to approach from the front mm -hmm. and um, lower your tone of voice and speak um, clearly and slowly. And if you ask a question, you have to wait. Mm. Because if that person is, which when, when I've trained police officers, yeah. what do police officers want when they ask a question? An answer. An answer. Right. That's so right. You and it's have, about asserting authority, getting right. control of the you situation, right? You have to right? wait and let them process it. Mm. Because if they are verbal, yeah. they probably will answer it. Mm. Um, the other thing is to maybe talk about, instead of, Shooting questions off. Sure. Just talk about the day. Right. Engage them in a in right. a conversation that is um, nice, building a little bit of trust. Mm -hmm. Talk about yourself. I was going to say maybe yourself. Yep. Right? Talk How, about yourself. yourself. Hey, right. You know, yeah. I I have um, a woman that worked at the senior center that actually followed a woman with dementia out the building, and she was going home. And. Senior centers are not places for drop-offs to take care of their loved ones with dementia, right. unless there's a special program, right. and we're going to talk about that. Um, but the woman went right alongside of her. She goes, it's a gorgeous day. Can I go for a walk with you? Would you mm -hmm. mind? Mm -hmm. And they strolled around, and she was able to redirect her back to the, to the senior center, center saying, you know, as they were talking, um, she found out who her caregiver was and said, well, guess what? going to be back at this time so that gives us enough time to walk back and meet them yeah. so it's like you know uh, it's it's not hard right, right, it's right. it's just knowledge but because if you don't know how right. can you even do right. it how would well, you even we, guess? we how would you live even in a society of what time mm. I'm, I'm this yeah. right yeah. everything is you know limited right? you know and so being able to slow down in that moment is it's invaluable for the individual with dementia um and and yet sometimes it's painstaking for the caregiver right? but, and to have places where as, as a caregiver you know you can go because i need a where, break it, and where, where folks who are there if you're going with somebody are going to have that kind of training right. that's right. going to be such right. a, a relief and that's yeah. a great segue. So talk to us about kind of the, this Daybreak program. What, what yeah, is Yeah, so, so about five years ago, um, the Hudson Senior Center, I worked with the director there to try and establish a three-hour grant-funded program where the caregiver can get respite. So the caregiver would drop their loved one mm -hmm. off, and they would engage in activities like we would do at Pleasantries. Mm -hmm. And they'd get lunch, and it would give the caregiver just enough time to either take a breath, <laughs> go for lunch with the friend, go get right. their hair done, go to a doctor's appointment, mm -hmm. um, and it was a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. But the value of it was that there was like a $15 donation. Mm -hmm. It's just like almost free. Mm -hmm. And um, so for people where the money issue comes in, mm -hmm. it's a great supplement to the other hours that you need home care or right. full day care right. or um, so daybreak now has expanded mm -hmm. so it was so, it so successful a number of years ago and really kind of grew and grew yeah and yeah. so as part of our dementia friendly efforts in Hudson Northboro and Marlboro mm -hmm. each of those senior centers now have the daybreak program so now we have individuals in the community who are literally going mm. to each program at each center well, and that was my question so um, our in your experience of the Hudson, um, Northboro, and Marlboro, are they doing um, like 
Hudson has two days. Marlboro has so Monday, Wednesday. Hudson, uh, Marlboro has Tuesday, Thursday. So it's not, one day a week a one for day each week. senior center. One day. Okay, so it's Tuesday, you. Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. I know Hudson's so Thursday. You, so you are saying you have seniors that are actually going to those different ones outside of their own community. Oh, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah. yeah. They and started out originally. Cases, they, they can actually take the senior bus. You know, oh, they, yeah. They tr yeah. provide transportation. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and they, they don't discriminate. They'd say, yeah. well, we're supposed to kind of stay within yeah. this, but, yeah. 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 you know. But they're okay with that. And so, then if people needed more, yeah. that's when a pleasantries comes in or sure. a, a home care comes sure. in. And, I, and I'm just or, going to mention, because yeah. I know that one of the things that those three senior center directors were talking about was the ideal would be to have five community. Yeah. The ideal would be to have some place where you know that you can go yeah. every day, yeah. right? And, right. And, and, right? And many well, of these folks I've heard you just, just, or I've heard folks there describe, and they say, you know, the, the, the person, the person who has memory loss, looks mm -hmm. starts looking forward to that. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, it's like, ten thirty. Yeah. Where, you know, I used where to are we have today. I used to right? have guests that on Saturday morning, oh. they'd wake up. They'd when are we going up. to Tammy's? <laughs> they get up, get dressed. Some forgot what it was. Some asked, you know, they were going to school. Yeah, I'm right. getting up. I'm ready for school. Yeah. Um, routine and structure mm -hmm. are really important too. Yeah. So that's a great. Now I just want to mention one other thing, just or one other kind of program that I'd like you to describe, and that is a memory cafe. Oh, I know sure. You yep. are. I, I got interested in in those, and then realized that you are. You would actually created the first one mm -hmm. while you were at Pleasantries. Mm -hmm. You just and kind of talk about that and of kind of where that has gone, and and how that fits into this whole kind of dementia friendly communities right. model. So there can't be enough memory cafes. Um, I did start the first one in Massachusetts in 2011, mm -hmm. and it is 2018, almost 19, and we have almost 100 wow, cafes in Massachusetts. Yeah. Wow. So what is it? And the concept was created in Europe, and the United States started in 2008. And it's a place where you are going to go with your loved ones, so the caregiver and the loved one with memory impairment. Mm -hmm. Go for a couple of hours. It's free to attend. There's refreshments, entertainment. Some cafes do activities. Um, but the idea behind it is that there's no failure there. Everybody there accepts you, understands the disease. And then what we've seen, which is brilliant, is all these friendships form because they're going through a similar journey, and what we right. know about the both, disease... Both the caregivers and the folks who have got memory. Yes, issues. and yeah. what we know to be fact is family and friends start to disappear yeah. when the disease starts to progress. So right. those caregivers need people mm -hmm. in their lives. They need a, what I call a new social network. network. Yeah, right. Right. And so, right. and the people with shared interests. Right. And what we've done in shared interests. Yeah. What we've done in Metro West is all the cafes and Westbrook did change because it was competing with Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. So all the cafes in the Metro West area do not compete. They're all on different days, times, and locations. There's senior centers, restaurants. There's the one at Pleasantries. Um, they can be in libraries. Mm -hmm. There's the Northboro ones at the library. So, and that again. It takes support mm -hmm. financially, mm -hmm. um, and and usually the facilitators are doing it from their heart, mm -hmm. passion, give back to right. the community, and then, you know, through sponsorships or mm -hmm. grants or, or soliciting sure. donations, um, we've been able to maintain them and just keep seeing them grow. They even have uh, multilingual okay. cafes now. Sure. Sure. Um, so. And yeah. I know that in those in those three communities, each of the commu the, uh, the Marlboro Hudson. Northbro, each one is approaching the kind of ongoing fundraising in a different way. Mm -hmm. I know in the case of Northbro, the, the, the Friends of the Senior Center yep. has just said, you know, we got this, we're doing it, you know. I think, in, but in each of the communities, once it's there, you the, see that value. The, yeah, 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 the support network yeah. is, is tremendous. Right. Now, now I'm going to give you one, one, uh, one uh, a memory cafe story. I was talking to my friend Trish Pope, right, mm -hmm. who is uh, the Senior Center Director in, um, in Marlboro and former City Councilor. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so they'd started one, they'd started one, and, and she said, so the last one that they had, and once again, this went from like, you know, nobody to like typically about 15, 20 people. The last one they had, there's in a separate room, this was actually at a restaurant, oh, did you hear about it? Yes, I yeah. heard about it. And then, so they, they were doing the memory cafe, but there was also some folks who had booked a birthday party for that day, and there was an, another part of that, mm -hmm. it was a very big room, right? 
Well, by the end, they're all doing it. They're all together. There's oh, like the birthday party and the fantastic. folks at the memory cafe, <laughs> that's right? Great. And so everybody is kind of coming out. But once again, the, the, the goal of life, yeah. right, is not to have a great memory, but to have a good time. Right. We actually, you know? we the one I facilitated in uh, Sudbury Senior Center, mm -hmm. we had people coming in and saying, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm like, come on in, yeah. you know? Sure, and they would participate in. and right. engage with the right. folks. Right. So right. it's non-labeling, there's no stigma attached to it. Well, I think that's the biggest thing, right? When as, as soon as you, as a, a caregiver, you find yourself that you have a loved one who has memory impairment, right? That they are, like, it immediately, you're right, that it's almost like kind of um, peeling a carrot you know, those layers of your social network just sort of fall. And it is not intentional, no. but but your your friends who you had, you traveled with, you did lots of things. They, they don't know how to interact. It becomes awkward. Right. It's, you know, you're juggling a million appointments, you know, for your loved one, and it just happens, and then you're so isolated. Right. So Because those folks also don't know how to kind of slow down, you know, to right. actually ask a question. Right. And wait right. for the answer. Right, right. It's, and it's, it's awkward, it's, it's, right? It's, yes. Like, you know, yes. we used to engage, you know, our wives used to be best friends, and now someone is maybe nonverbal. So, like, that's now it's awkward. Right? And what we're finding in the community as a whole is that every place of business, every person has somehow been touched or has not engaged with someone with dementia. Of course. Um, and, and what better way to provide the education in all, all the community segments, mm -hmm. right? Um, I did a training for uh, the, the town employees mm -hmm. at, in one of the towns, and one of them came up to me and said, this is so valuable. In fact, I have so-and-so, and he comes, mm -hmm. and I have to take <laughs> mm -mm -mm right. time, mm -hmm. and she gives him that time. Right. It's about flexibility. Oh, but give, give the voting example. Apropos, since next next week is, is election day. Oh, no, it wasn't you. It was, I was like, what's that no, story? It was Trish again, because <laughs> Trish had done some training, and among other had been training, and among other things, the town clerk or the city clerk mm -hmm. had wanted to get training for poll workers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the poll workers afterwards came up and said, Trish, that was so valuable, because they, the, they had had the primary. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, there was a lady there who was really kind of nervous, and, and she said, I really helped her. I really helped her, you know, get to her ballot. Yep. And she just walked out. So proud wow. that she had done that. She voted. Yep. Isn't yep. that How cool? Was, yeah, How right. That's that. called a dementia-friendly poll. Exactly. That's right. what that's called. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, exactly. and that's it wasn't hard for her. Right. She right. probably felt so good. Yeah. Right. This, you know, the poll worker with some training felt confident. And to the do trainer that. felt great too. Right. Of course, right. You right. Know, right. Right. Just like, right. Well, you really felt you, you did right. your job. Right. You know, there's no, there's absolutely no negative. Right. that can come out of it because mm -hmm. the negative's already there. So mm -hmm. if things get created and taught, at a, at, they'll, they'll change it. Right. So right. Jamie, just very quickly before we have to sort of wrap up, tell us about what you're doing now and kind of how you've taken all those years of experience and what, what you're offering in terms of kind of training and who you're training, just so our listeners know. So my focus has really changed to healthcare professionals, and organizations who are caring for people living with Alzheimer's or dementia, and also assisting in the efforts, assisting communities in the efforts to create dementia-friendly community. Okay. My mission is to create a dementia-friendly healthcare system mm -hmm. so that everybody has the highest of competency, mm -hmm. understanding, compassion. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I am doing now. I tried to do both <laughs> and it right. was a little too much sure. um but yeah i i want to make the community better and mm -hmm. through the healthcare systems and sure. the players that take care of that person mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. if they don't have the tools it's they gonna go it. wrong right you know but you're just uniquely qualified to do it now because of your background right. because of what you actually right. did your She's day job it. day right. day in and day out i day keep saying i Gosh darn, I need to write a book just from right. my 10 years of, of experience with my guests. In a few years. We'd yeah. love to interview you as an author. I know, right? right. right. So, Shelby, this was a great idea. It was. Yes. This was fun. Yes. Thank you, as always. Thank you. Thank you You're very welcome. much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. No, Thank the, you. I, and, I, and this is always a delight, you know. And I, and I, I hope all of you kind of take, can take away some things from this conversation in terms of even dealing with the folks that you know who, who may have some memory loss issues. Thanks again to You're both welcome. of you. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month on the next uh, installment of Frank and Mary here in Westbrook. Thank you. <laughs>